well as as a group, strong. I could see once I heard concrete jungle and um, slave driver. That was it. I was totally committed. By 1973, the whalers had cracked Jamaica. Now it was time for them to take on the world. They were signed to Island Records, and for the first time, a reggae band had access to the best recording facilities. the Caribbean and I photographed him all the time we developed a very close relationship where we started to write together Bob was very beautiful to, to look at to photograph he was just what the white world wanted they can't they, they would not accept Peter Tosh who was very very bright also because he was too black they never let Jimmy Cliff through because he was too black but um, Bob as the person leading the group could go through and pull all the others through, and he could be the voice for, for them. Bob really wanted to get his voice out, to really stand as an example for liberation. The first album released with Ireland was 1973's Catch a Fire. When Ireland released the first album, Catch a Fire, with the zipper lighter, for about a year and a half, it, would not, it didn't sell. I mean, it's, it didn't even sell enough to cover the recording session. And so basically, I knew that I had the answer. I said to him, if you smoke, you shouldn't be ashamed of it. It is part of your culture. My approach was to photograph Bob in the light that we have in Jamaica, showing the color of our skin the way it should be shown. And I took his shirt off because he has a lovely color. And once the light hit his skin and bounced back onto my lens, that was it. Catch a Fire was re-released with a new cover shot by Esther. That was such a controversial record in America because it was banned, and because it was banned, it became a huge hit. Bob's songs were parables, messages of faith and warning. He never ceased to speak out against the oppressors using his influence to highlight the exploitation of the black race. His lyrics reflected the plight of the demoralized people of Jamaica, seeking escape from the slums. Where Jamaica is, you have one television station at those days. Yeah? Most people listen to the radio or you buy the paper. Some people couldn't afford the paper. So a lot of people can get the message within one year through the music. If you go to Jamaica and you look around, you can see what Bob talking about. You see, you don't have to guess. It's not like a dream. It just, it's not, you know, some people write and they write like, Fear it tears. You have to check the Bob was a poet also, you know. At times he called me a slave driver because I was always pushing him to write. And said, come on, let's write a song. And so basically I encouraged him to take his guitar with us everywhere we go. And so we would um, go on the island, so he'd bring his guitar and he'd do the reggae rhythm and the song would be born. It wasn't very hard to write songs because it was what was happening around us. <laughs> The songs Bob sang, they were, yeah, logic and common sense. He was strong to his cause. We developed a very close relationship where we started to write together, and we wrote Get Up, Stand Up, Flying Over Haiti, a country which had experienced the most awful poverty and the most awful pain uh, with slavery. We just wrote it there on the plane, on the paper, and just start talking, and he'd beat out a little rhythm on the seat of the plane, and that would be it. He wrote some great pop songs, 
with catchy choruses that you can sing. Right, that's the surface level. On an emotional level, and especially a groove level, the Whalers were an incredible band. Bob was an incredibly passionate singer, and these are things that strike an emotional chord no matter what style of music you're in, into. I mean, you can hate reggae and love Bob Marley. You know, it's just universal, and he's got a universal message. It was a, he's positive. Lord, I gotta keep on revolution and the struggle was using the pen to speak for us and using the music to drive that the lyrics to put the thing out so that all people could identify it that it could become universal and really cross over so I encourage you to write more protest songs rather than love songs Bob managed to have like these different personalities I mean the same album he could be doing a song about war, a really brutal, graphic, realistic song. And then he'll be singing Waiting in Vain, or Is This Love? You know, he just was able to translate whatever was going on in his head. It just came out, and it was always sounding like Bob. And he never sold out, got soppy or soft or anything like that. It was all part of him. Just He, he wasn't ever going to be just a relentless, militant, Hey, what is your own? What's your music my own to you? Is my own, my, the music to me, the music is more than music to me. It go further than music, you know. It go with, with I don't know it further than music. But you used it as a, a strong message. I mean, words like a hungry man is an angry me. man. Yeah, the music used me. <laughs> Whatever it is, there's no doubt Bob Marley knows how to use his music. 12,000 people, more than half of them white, came to hear him perform. And in a trance-like mystical state, he carried them with him and left them shouting for more. Despite this obvious commercial success, he appears to live the life he preaches. But as Bob's fame amplified, so did the media pressure. He wasn't the god collide figure that he is now, but he was certainly one of the most famous men in the world. People started coming from Harvard, Oxford University, Cambridge, and so to investigate uh, the whole, what was going on in Jamaica. Um, I coach them. I just say to Bob, no, you just have to be yourself, be strong, speak with your own dialect, the way you speak. Don't try to, you know, articulate for them the way they want to do it. All the reporters had to come through me, and Bob Rose was then free to be himself, to speak in his own, uh, way to articulate the way he articulate and for Jamaicans not to be ashamed of their accent. He didn't get a good time from the press. I asked him about this and said, you know, why? You're always getting slagged off. Why are you sitting there talking to me now? And he just said, um, you know, comes with the territory. I've got to keep going out there and playing and trying to make myself better. The first tour we went to America, but still people were calling him, uh, you know, talking about oh, weird hair and savages or whatever. I asked him too if he ever got sick of trotting out the same set every night. His shows have been slagged off for going through the motions. And I mean, if you've ever seen any footage of Bob Marley, you know he's no way going through the motions. I mean, he, he gets carried away and he was going to another place in himself every night. He was up there with the rock idol. You know, he could play in Los Angeles and the, the front tables would be the Stones and, you know, the rock royalty come to check him out. And not put off by the fact that he was a ghettoized reggae artist. By 1974, the Whalers had fallen apart. Let me tell you this. Whalers split up because Bob was getting all the attention. Um, that's Tosh. I mean, he, Tosh wanted to be Bob. He was very, very upset 
because he didn't want to be a front man. He didn't want a front. He just wanted to just help to do the work and get the message out. So I encouraged him to just reform. And so he went back and uh, he got himself a manager. And the manager renegotiated a new contract. And then they became Bob Marley and the Whalers. So the Whalers could be anyone after that. But basically with Family Man and Carly driving the, the rhythm section. Though they broke up, and it was a very sad time because Peter and Bob were like John Lennon and Paul McCartney together. However, Bob Marley's star was on the rise. Now that he had become an international celebrity, politicians sought to use him as a pawn in their power games. Jamaica's rival parties were both keen to conscript him because he had street credibility. He was not just a Jamaican singer. He was an international singer because the message that he carried was the message of third world people all over the world. In doing so, of course, he helped to put Jamaican music on the map internationally. He's also very significant, I think, because he's one of those rare figures